Oh, another way. This shore show for years, in which we had a lot of arguments on with the committees, was strictly an amateur horse show. There was times when they tried to take it away from me, uh, uh, as as one of the men uh, with the show, uh, to put it back in some more or less specialized people, you know, coming in with this and that. We had a lot of wonderful horses. The uh, Sheriff's Posse was in there, the Castro outfit of 100 horses, and several riding horses. Pleasant Hill had side saddle horses and beautiful riding horses and gaiters and everything. But I would not let the people go into anything else but a strictly amateur show. And it remained that as far as until the time it just, the last year I think it changed a little to where they allowed more or less professionals and give them blue ribbons for it. But nothing. Anybody got an honorable mentioning, we give them a ribbon or an honorable mentioning. But the people came in with a sway back horse and had a rope around his nose. As long as he performed their duties, they got a prize, but nothing else. That's the way it stayed, too. And I was very sure of that. And I thought, I think Mickey can back me up. One year there, they decided to, they were going to do it anyway. And so I said, okay, go ahead, I'm through. And uh, they were going to do it. But finally, toward the end, they weakened and they let go as it was, because I wasn't going to raise a hand, and they didn't get no prizes either, because people wouldn't donate to them, because it was strictly ambushes. Some little kids couldn't even ride a horse. They were hanging on, but they got a prize because they'd done it. And that's what I was proud about this horse show. It was very, very successful. Time, so many things started from my pit show. Oh, nothing. So, uh, our show, which is the Lafayette show, started Johnny Miller, which started the Contra Costa Sheriff's Posse. Uh, oh, probably the second or third year he started. He had a beautiful array of horses. And that same posse grew to a, quite an extended posse. Also went to the islands and performed after this. Also went to Eisenhower's inauguration. And some of you people might remember when he last sued some of the people in the inauguration parade. Yeah, and there was quite a write-up about that. Does anybody remember that when that happened? Well, that's true. And Johnny Miller and his posse, and that's all started from this horse show. And the Western Horses Magazine, also started by Paul Alberts, also was created here and is still existing, and it's made in uh, Colorado somewhere. And it's all started from this horse show, and Paul Alberts and his wife started that. So that's just some of the things that Lafayette has done to the horse show. All the shows that hold, are, are held, other than the first one at Dr. Hamlin's properties, sidewalks were put in about 1937 or 38, and it started from Huff Street down to where the old post office used to be, and there was a, quite a step off to go to Bill's, and it remained that way for quite a few years until they improved it. But that's where the sidewalk went from Huff Avenue, oh, about 200 feet east, and then it went up to Colonel Garrett's building from my, uh, on the east side of Huff up to about Colonel Garrett's building. And that was put in about 37 or 38. And that was done by some of the people who were doing the work on the highway, uh, the contractors they had. Now, let's see, there's a few other things. I'm just telling you facts, folks, and there's anything else you <laughs> want to know. Of course, we had... Uh, we had hitching poles to tie the yeah, horses well, up. Yeah, well, I got a lot of things here. When they came in the round yeah, I, I got that down here. I got some specialties here. Uh, I'll tell you, Kelsey, uh, Lafayette, I say Kelsey because we're living there now. But Kelsey, uh, Lafayette had a lot of things going. We we really had big fun here. I, I'd like to tell you, I could tell you hours and hours and write a book on it, but I'll give you some of the highlights, what made things fun. And I have front page uh, from the Post Inquirer, all in red, says the Old West lives out in Lewis and Lafayette in the Post Inquirer. And I still have copies, great big red letters in the front page. Plus, uh, in, in Lafayette, when horses that come in my place every year, from nine to 19 horses 
come in my place during the day. I had a hitching post right over Solinary's place, 200 foot long with a water trough, and a man to take care of that water with blue rock to make sure the horses never got sick. We rented that place from Solinary to put over there. But the horses had come in, and I don't know if you people know Mrs. Donaldson used to be in Orinda, had the horses there, and he was the deputy sheriff. Do you remember that? <laughs> and the horses had come in. I had a white coat and a big scoop shovel. <laughs> and about seven, eight people working in my place, and sometimes 10, 11 during those days. And the horses would get in, but I remember Peggy Donaldson, this was. She came into place with a horse, and pretty soon there were a couple of them probably in the place at that time. I said, hey, Peggy, get your horse out of here. Your horse is getting nervous. Didn't make it. <laughs> so I, and I go and I get my white coat, put it on. I got the shovel, raked it up, and I had double front, double windows out, double doors out in front. And the people you know in Kelseyville or in Lafayette, when the horse shows, they were like ants. Now you, you've just got to see to believe it. I got a lot of pictures. I wish I'd have brought them. There you have some here. But anyway, I just open that door and go like that. And I almost get trampled to death. The people come in and see what happened. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's no true. Of course, there was times we had slot machines, and then I used to board the one-inch boards. We used to buy them Corbett, put on the floors to keep the horses from going through the floors. And I, I'll tell you, this is the truth. There's a man that can witness everything I say over yeah, there, and, and I think Mr. Ellis and some of the others. And uh, of course, there was that big explosion in 1944. Bob, I know most of you people know, blew about half of the windows in town out here in Chelsea or Lafayette from Port Chicago. I say, well, and I told you about the employing uh, people, be, uh, employing people at a dollar a day, and boy, I'm telling you, that was something. The action in Lewis during the war show. White chance shovel for Peggy Dobson. Board for his beer, carrots, and horses. Horse and car, and he is. Well, folks, that's the best I can do. If any people want to ask me questions, the best of my knowledge, I'll answer them. Thank you, Lou. I appreciate that. I was hoping that you get down to the point where the horses were coming into the world. Yeah, miss that. Every, every horse got a carrot and every rider oh, got yeah. a beer. They get a free drink. Yes, they do. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll call that just, 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 just a minute, Lou. Yeah. Uh, every one of these horses that came in, the rider got a free beer and that horse got a carrot. And if he didn't stay on his horse, he never got it. The horse got the carrot, but the guy didn't get the beer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. You yeah, I would wrap like it up, Mick. One more thing. Uh, Lou and I were on the membership committee of the Horsemen's Association when they had an option on 43 acres of land between Jonas Hill Road and Burton Station out in there. And they were going to build a clubhouse and stables and corrals and arena for a permanent place for the horse show. And it's a crying shame that that never went through because I'll bet Lafayette would have been known the world over because that was really a horse show we had here. But it would just came up to about 43 and that was the war years and the thing just fell through and it's a dirty shame it did. Otherwise we'd been on the map. <laughs> <laughs> Tell you. Yeah, no. Lou, Mickey, your remarks have gotten to uh, Joan Merriman. Where'd she go? She yeah, wants yeah. to know if you could donate your notes to the society. Sure. Yeah. Okay, sure. please, would you? Sure. We appreciate it. Uh, one thing before we close, or a couple things. Number one, if any of you have not renewed your membership. <laughs> Why, uh, if you got the yellow bulletin put out by our bulletin editor, Mary McIver, we sure love to have your renewal. If you are here tonight as a friend or a guest of someone who is a member of the society and you are not a member, 
Why, sign up, please. We'd sure love to have you as a member of the group. Um, Do we get it's the, amazing. Voice, the carrot or the beer? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on gender, Gary. <laughs> yeah. Really and truly, um, you'd be surprised how this group, I mean, we have a fine board of directors. Uh, there's hardly a meeting that we don't have better than a quorum. I mean, a quorum is necessary to conduct the business of the board, but we never have to worry. I belong to some groups, you know, sometimes you have to call somebody up, say, get here, we need a quorum. But the society, through the publication of the pictorial history, has really done a job for this town. And we have a couple of irons in the fire that uh, are kind of exciting, and we would want all of you, if you're not members, to please join us. And I couldn't close this meeting without thanking a few people. Uh, first off, I would love to thank everyone that participated and brought, you know, potluckers. Just the historical way of doing things. Everybody brings something, everybody shares. But I would like to thank again Esther Marchand for chairing this thing. I mean, uh, <laughs> tell you what, would you like to write the manual? <laughs> Just in case you won't do it again. <laughs> I'd like to thank Virginia Anderson for coming down and decorating the hall, all these beautiful flowers. Virginia. <laughs> Jean Baker, who's been our hostess all year long. Where's Jean? There she is. Jean, you were part of the group today. Joan Merriman, who uh, worried about this thing quite a bit. And, uh, <laughs> was here to do his job. Edith Biggers, she's hiding out. Edith was part of the setup crew today. Tremendous gal. Yeah, I see her. I pointed over there. She just won't come out and take a bow. And Martha Gridley, where's our treasurer? Where's money bags? Where's Martha? Martha's a treasurer. She's had a lot of fun this year because we... Uh, She's at the bar spending the money. There she comes. She was at the bar spending the money. <laughs> Thank you, Martha. The next person, really and truly, is somebody that I've depended on uh, all year long. She's the immediate past president of the society. Just a tremendous person. And every time I got stuck, I just picked up the phone and called Chris Schreiber. Chris, please. And then a fellow who practically lives within this building. I mean, no, he lives on Moraga Boulevard and has uh, for many, many years. But he is the houseman or uh, the booking agent for the Lafayette Veterans Association. And he does a tremendous job. And he was here today getting everything for us. Skid Thomas, we really appreciate it. <laughs> and the donor of that most expensive amber liquid upon the table is Ed Stokes of Diablo Foods, who donated the coffee. Wow. And we're so proud of him. Hey. 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 I tell you, uh... Could we give a good yell for Lou, who donated the wine? Hey. Being Italian and not a Brazilian, I'd rather you drank the wine. So, <laughs> 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 if there is nothing further, to come before this meeting, I'd like to declare it adjourned. And thank you again for coming. It was a tremendous evening. Thank you very much, Mickey, and thank you, Lou. Just, just beautiful. Thank you very much. Great. I don't remember a concrete <laughs> sidewalk in town. Now, there were some wooden ones down at the Pioneer store, had some wooden ones, and front of the grocery store, Dad Starks had some wood and there was a porch like over at uh, Brownie's place over there, but no concrete sidewalk. And I think the reason there were none here is because the road was just a dirt road and nothing else. But when he came through and cut the new road, then they knew where the curb line was and they put curbs and gutters and started building sidewalks at that time. But now, starting when I got here in 36 now, starting from the store and coming this way, there was about 100 feet of vacant property there. And the store was the only thing there. 
In fact, when the dad starts saying you're going to build a store up there, they say, what the hell are you building it clear out of town for? <laughs> <laughs> they I was nothing till you came to the little, used to be schoolhouse, I guess it was. They moved there, which housed the telephone exchange and the post office and the library there. Now, Amelia Shutt at that time was postmistress, and Marie Michaud was the telephone operator. And as I remember, Catherine Shutt was one of the operators down there, but there's a little question about that. But I'm sure Catherine Shutt, it was a 24-hour-a-day outfit, and I'm sure she took one of the shifts. I don't know. Then Carrie Van Meter at that time, she still hauled the mail, went down to the station, got the mail and hauled it up, but I think she took care of the library. Now, I'm not too sure about that, but I think that's about right. There's a lot of these things that's a little fuzzy, you know, so if I get off, <laughs> I don't worry about it. Then, then you came to Marie Bill's place and Manuel Lucas' service station on the corner, but now later he put in a better service station. It was an associated station. He had a little, little wooden place there for a while, and then they put up a nice station there. And that was all the buildings there was until you got down around the Pioneer store. Then going west, where Lou's place was, next to Lou's place, Burton Moranini had a service station in there. Then next to him, old Ed Morrison had a plumbing shop, combination plumbing shop and firehouse. <laughs> <laughs> he had old rods there and an old fire engine was sitting in there. I don't know what the hell it was, but it sure would sure be a relic nowadays. And then beyond that, I think it was a drugstore. Now, I don't know if Stanley owned the drugstore and Winkler worked for him at that time or whether it came a little later. But as I can remember, there was a drugstore and that was all of it over there. Now, on the north side of the street, of course, there was a blacksmith shop down there. Everybody knows about the blacksmith. That was Eleanor's uncle that owned the blacksmith shop. We used to go down to his house, the big two-story house back there in some trees. That guy was an artist. In the house, he had made rose bushes and things in the blacksmith shop, made leaves and petals on them and everything like that. And you look at the leaves and there was holes all in them. I thought, gee, might run out of metal or something. Well, what the hell is all the holes in there for? Well, he said, you never saw a rose bush that didn't have the bugs eat the holes. In the <laughs> so he said I had to bug at the leaves too. <laughs> then, Right next to that was a little bitty shack there, I'll call it. Well, I had a hot dog and ice cream shack or something, right in a little swale there, right by the shop. Then Carrie Van Meter's house. And then, I tell you, they tore these houses down right about that time, too. We got here in the summer of 36, and those buildings across the road next to Oak Hill Road, there was about three buildings there. Brown, Clarence Brown had a store there, an old hard, you did have a hardware store. I'll get to a little more of that later. And there was a, Heine Hodap had a barber shop over there, and I think Colonel Garrett had a shop over there or something. But now this store that Clarence Brown had a hardware store in, 35 or something like that, he moved out of there for some reason, and Dad Starks, that only had the building there, that's when he moved all his stock and fixtures over there, and kept him in there while he tore down the old store and built this new store, and that was in 35, then, see? But by the fall of 36, those buildings were all gone because they were, the stores were on this side, and in order to widen Mount Dablo Boulevard or Tunnel Road, they had to widen it on the other side and they had to demolish all those stores. So then the, by the winter of 36, they were all gone. So I could say that by Christmas of 36, there were no stores <coughs> beyond Kerry Van Meter's house there. They had torn those down. And after you crossed Oak Hill Road there, there were just houses. Oh, uh, Thompson's and Hall's and the Weldon's and a few of them up there, just houses here and there up there. And let's see, what else have I got here? Oh, a little argument. Am I running over? Uh, yeah, yeah, just a little bit. This little bit. Well, I won't go into C.C. Morse then. There's an argument about that too. I would swear C.C. Morse started the first newspaper here in 1936. But now Leo Coleman told me that Al Snedeker had started some newspaper before. 
And I can't remember that or can't find anybody else that remembers that. But I thought Moore started the first paper here. He started the Lafayette Sun. Yeah, Lafayette Sun. Well, did, did uh, Snedeker have any well, kind uh, of Marie a... Marie Snedeker told me one time when we had lunch together, yes, that her husband had a little, uh, oh, kind of a... It tabloid. Really a newspaper. Yeah, a little tabloid. Before little, 1936. Yeah, that was before well, Morse. Well, then I don't know that, and I Lou don't, don't remember that. that, and a lot of people don't, see? So, there's a question there. But anyhow, Morse had the paper for a couple of years, and he sold it to a guy by the name of Wadsworth. Then he, Morse bought it back again, and he sold it again to Carl Detar. And I think Morse was in cahoots with Detar or something like that. <coughs> And then they eventually sold it to Silverman. And he went up there on Oak Hill Road and built that place up there. And at that time, he put in presses and everything up there, the big building, and printed the newspaper here. And C.C. Uh, C. Morris had one of the first sons in the little red uh, uh, former uh, uh, yeah. uh, bar. When, when Lou built the new roundup and moved that building back there, Morris was in there for a while. Yeah. yeah. So that's as I remember it. I'm crazy all right. But during the 40s now, during the war years, St. Mary's had a pre-flight out there, and there were a lot of servicemen in the area. And Lafayette became famous or notorious, I don't know what it was, as the Strip. Remember the Strip, they called it. And it was called that on account of all the nightclubs we had. You remember that? Coming from Marinda after you got by... After you got by Upper Happy Valley Road and Appenberger had the Red Mill there, and you come in town, right at the end of town where the road curved, they had the curve over there, so-called because of the curve in the road. It's the Cape Cod House now. Then you came down to where the Lafayette Federal was. That was the Acapulco. Remember that? Oh, no. Down Out Sam's. where the Federal is, at the Acapulco. You remember that? Then, huh? Al Sam's. Well, it was Acapulco first, it was wasn't like it? Say, Jasper. Was it all time? I don't know. <laughs> then you came down to the tunnel in. Oh, Gus Schwartz had the tunnel in. Yeah. Then down on the corner of Oak Hill Road and Mount Dabble Boulevard was the Rose Lee. Yeah. And that later changed to the El Molino, and then it was Danny Van Allen's, and I don't know how many times that changed either. Yeah. So, I guess that's all I got to say, and I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes here, but as I can remember it, that's what I thought. Thank you, Mickey. Mickey's improved his technique. I've been with Mickey on trips to uh, several places in this world, and every night during happy hour, he gets out his little notebook boy and he writes everything down. And at the end of the trip, everybody gets about a 16-page report of where we were and what we did. He's improved. He puts it down on paper the day it happens. Uh, to wind it up, we get Lou's bosom buddy, and really an, an old friend of ours, uh, Lou Borgazzani, uh, who's quite a businessman in this town. And when I first met Lou, I never met anybody that was so enthusiastic about anything that had to do with Lafayette. And, uh, you know, there came a time when it came retirement time, and he figured that uh, he'd leave the city that he really had helped put together. So, Lou Borgasani, would you like to come up here and give us your no, I'll give you what I can. <laughs> impressions, please? Now, folks, you're going to hear the first construction man speaking. Uh, if somebody would make me mad, get me sore, and then I could talk, and you probably would want to hear some of it, or some of it you wouldn't want to hear. <laughs> but anyway, I'll tell you uh, some of the things that how it happened and what it, why it didn't happen a lot yet. And say, I was born in 1902 in Martinez, so I was familiar with more or less Lafayette. But at the young age, I've wandered around the United States. Can you folks hear me back? Can you speak a little louder? Yes. At the young age, well, I was, I'll start over. I was born in Martinez in 1902. And I went to school there. 
but at the young age I ventured out to the United States on construction work. And eventually I knew about Lafayette by traveling through, going to the probably Berkeley and one to the old tunnel there, which you were scared to go through, but you went through anyway. I followed construction work for several years. And uh, in 1926, I was in Florida during the hurricane there. And I had to come back to California because everything stopped. Well, I eventually came back to Martinez and went to to the bridge job in Martinez for testing on the railroad bridge. And after that was through, I came to Lafayette because the dam in Lafayette was started in 1927, no, 20, yeah, 27, it started. And I became foreman again on this job. And I was foreman on this job the night it, I was foreman on the job the night it caved in in 1928 at 1.30 in the morning. And one of my men was on trucks hauling dirty, came running out. I happened to be on the far end of the dam. And he said, hey, Lou, he says, the dam is caving in, it's cracking. I says, that guy must have been drinking. That's what I thought. <laughs> so I rushed in, I had a Hudson groom then. Rushed in, and sure enough, it was cracking and sinking. It had sinked about 10 feet in some places, some cracks were three feet. That was the outer edge of it in about a 100 foot circle. And well, constantly, we got a hold of the big men out there, Mrs. Sturgeon and a lot of them, and we had the job stopped. And we finished, well, we had 10 more days to finish this job. And we stopped. And that was the end of the job. And, and I think the water company in two years or so finished the job. I wasn't around here then. But uh, I went to Martinez and with Mr. Pollock again, the construction of, went on the dirt job for the railroad bridge and went right on with the American bridge on the bridge job, the railroad bridge in Martinez. Well, I eventually got in with my parents or my, some of my folks on a beer truck after this was over to get, I had a certain thing promised me and a roof. If I would do good, I could buy it. Well, I had Lafayette and I also had uh, several towns, Concord, Arenda, and when the day come for the agreement that if I worked it up to a certain point, I was to have it. Well, it didn't materialize, so I quit just like that. That was on June the 5th, 1934. And the 6th, I happened to know the people, I was practically broke. And the people that were going to back me up to buy this business, I rushed over to them. There were one in Pittsburgh, one in uh, Port Chicago, and one in uh, Concord. So I rushed over and told them what happened. And I said, there's a little business in Lafayette that I know that I would like to buy, and I know they have a good stock. And that was Ma Hunt's place, which then was the Lafayette Inn. And Ma Hunt was a known person. People come in for years asking about her. She was great for her pies, and I've never met her personally. But I knew the family and all of them, and I'm telling you, she was known all over. But anyway, that's how I happened to come on the sixth day of June, 1934, I'll never forget that. Walked in and asked these people that had the place, my aunt then has already leased it out, and asked if I could buy the business. Well, they wanted $1,150. And my God, all I could get was $950 from these three people I was trying to borrow from. So they looked it over with their eagle eye. They were all up in age, these people, and they were shrewd. They were people that had a little money. And they'd look this old place over, the windows were little tiny windows, you know, and the floor was like this. <laughs> that was all right, that's what made the place. And anyway, I, uh, I said to him, I said, uh, well, I don't know what I can do, but I said, uh, suppose in two or three months I pay you the rest and I'll give you $950. They went for it. But the deal had to do be that night and the next morning I'd take over because I didn't want to lose any of the stock they had because I happened to know the stock they had. And so they did make a deal. And the next morning at 9 o'clock or 7 o'clock, I was in that place doing business. <laughs> and I gave the money, and fortunate enough, I was able to raise the money in the next two or three months of buying. And that's how I started business. Well, time went on, and I attended several of the meetings here at the Improvement Club with Mrs. Hatherton, Mr. Snedeker, and, uh, oh, let's see, there were several others. Uh, 
Uh, well, Mrs. Hazard was very Pretty interested. Wise. Pardon me? Wise. I will. <laughs> uh, well, anyway, we talked it over, and they had this fiesta coming at the town hall. <coughs> that was in 34. And I had my place of business going pretty good, and it was very, very cheap. <laughs> Ten cents was a hamburger. Ten cents for a glass of beer. People would go to work for a dollar. People would ring me up and say, do you have someone to come out and go to work? Now, how much would you pay? A dollar. And believe it or not, there were people went out and took those jobs for a dollar for eight and nine hours a day and worked. Now, that's in 34. Now, this is true. And I have been right there. There's a friend of mine right there that backed me up on that. And uh, Miriam Flood. And anyway, we, uh, we talked on this... Uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, we talked about this fiesta they were having down here, and being once or twice there long before different things at the town hall, but they were putting this fiesta. So I thought, well, what a wonderful thing. We'd go down there and we just move my business <coughs> for that night, starting about noon. That night I moved all my business and my help and everything down there, took the downstairs <laughs> floor, closed my place of business, and went down there. This is 1934, in September the 30th, I think it was, and started this business. Four of them, all the proceeds to go to the improvement club or to this uh, fiesta, in which we did. And uh, we done very good. We, I think that that night we might have had some slot machines down there, too. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, we done good, and uh, and then by the time that night was over, so successful, we talked about a horse show in connection with this to make this horse show, and uh, it was greeted so well by Mrs. Snedeker and the Floods and oh different people and uh, Mrs. Hetherton and uh, Stanley, which were all more or less tied up with the town hall, and. So I got to working on that. And believe it or not, I got a hold of the Floods. And I got a hold of uh, Dave Finley, McNeil, Soleil, Paul Alberts, the main man. He had a riding stable out here somewhere out of Spring Hill Road at that time. He had a lot of people coming out riding on Sundays. And asked them what they thought about it. And they thought it was a great thing. And by golly, from that time on, Paul Alberts got this together with a group of, uh, from the town hall, which was uh, some of my mentioned. I know there's a lot more, but I can't think of them all. And this horse show started in 1935 on the school grounds here in La Lafayette, or yeah, at Lafayette. There was about two or three acres there. And the sheriff's office, with his help, came along and helped us make an arena with socks, trucks, all kinds of blankets or anything just to make this arena, and that was the first horse show in 34, and uh, 35 in September. And that was the second fiesta and the horse show together. Of course, the fiesta was going, and from there on, the rest were all at Dr. Hammond's property from 36 on. And the money was raised, the first money was raised to help put the tennis court at the grammar school at Pilot, that right, Mr. Ellis? And, uh, and that money we raised around was $2,700, if I remember right. Yeah, and uh, for the two fairs and put the money in there for the tennis court. And so that was uh, how the, uh, the horse shows got started. Now I'll get to the cheetahs here because yeah. I... Yeah, got to wander in here and now I got to catch up with myself. That shows you what kind of a, a speaker I am. But anyway, I'm going to try to tell you just what happened. Oh, the East Bay Water Company <coughs> District, Utility District, was organized May 22nd, 1923. And the McCollumy Water reached a local distribution in 
June 23, 1929. If you want that record, that's one from the book. Not with any. Another way, this shore show for years in which we had a lot of arguments on with the committees was strictly an amateur horse show. There was times when they tried to take it away from me uh, uh, as, as one of the men uh, with the show uh, to put it back in some more or less specialized people, you know, coming in with this and that. We had a lot of wonderful horses. The uh, Sheriff's Posse was in there, the Castro outfit of 100 horses and several riding horses. Pleasant Hill had side saddle horses and beautiful riding horses and gators and everything. But I would not let the people go into anything else but a strictly amateur show. And it remained that as far as until the time it just, the last year I think it changed a little to where they allowed more or less professionals and give them blue ribbons for it. But nothing. Anybody got honorable mentioning, we give them a ribbon or an honorable mentioning. But the people came in with a sway back horse and had a rope around his nose. As long as he performed their duties, they got a prize, but nothing else. That's the way it stayed, too. And I was very sure of that. And I thought, I think Mickey can back me up. One year there, they decided to, they were going to do it anyway. And so I said, okay, go ahead, I'm through. And. Uh, they were going to do it, but finally toward the end they weakened and they let go as it was because I wasn't going to raise a hand and they didn't get no prizes either because people wouldn't donate to them because it was strictly amateurs. Some little kids couldn't even ride a horse. They were hanging on, but they got a prize because they had done it. And that's what I was proud about this horse show. It was very, very successful. Time so many things started from my pit show. Oh, nothing. So, uh, our show which Lafayette show started Johnny Miller which started the Contra Costa Sheriff's Posse uh, oh probably the second or third year he started he had a beautiful array of horses and that same posse grew to a, quite an extended posse also went to the islands and performed after this also went to Eisenhower's inauguration and some of you people might remember when he last sued some of the people in the inauguration parade. Yeah, and there was quite a write-up about that. Does anybody remember that when that happened? Well, that's true. And Johnny Miller and his posse, and that's all started from this horse show. And the Western Horses Magazine, also started by Paul Alberts, also was created here and is still existing, and it's made in uh, Colorado somewhere. And it's all started from this horse show, and Paul Alberts and his wife started that. So that's just some of the things that... Lafayette has done to their horse show. All the shows that hold, are, are held, other than the first one at Dr. Hamlin's properties, sidewalks were put in about 1937 or 38, and it started from Huff Street down to where the old post office used to be, and there was a, quite a step off to go to Bill's and it remained that way for quite a few years until they improved it. But that's where the sidewalk went from Huff Avenue, oh, about 200 feet east, and then it went up to Colonel Garrett's building from my, uh, on the east side of Huff up to about Colonel Garrett's building, and that was put in about 37 or 38, and that was done by some of the people who were doing the work on the highway, uh, the contractors they had. Now, See, there's a few other things. I'm just telling you facts, folks, and there's anything else you <laughs> want to know. Of course, we had... Uh, <coughs> we had hitching poles to tie the Yeah, well, up. I got a lot of things here. And they came in the round up yeah, and I, gave them three I got that down here. I got some specialties here. Uh, I'll tell you, Kelsey, uh, Lafayette, I say Kelsey because we're living there now, but Kelsey, uh, Lafayette, 
had a lot of things going. We we really had big fun here. I I'd like to tell you I could tell you hours and hours and write a book on it. But I'll give you some of the highlights. What made things fun? And I have front page uh, from the Post Enquirer, all in red, says the old West lives out in Lewis and Lafayette. In the Post Enquirer, and I still have copies, great big red letters in the front page. Plus, uh, in in Lafayette, uh, when Horses that come in my place every year. From nine to 19 horses come in my place during the day. I had a hitching post right over Solinary's place, 200 foot long with a water trough, and a man to take care of that water with blue rock to make sure the horses never got sick. We rented that place from Solinary to put over there. But the horses that come in, and I don't know if you people know, Mrs. Donaldson used to be in Orinda, had the horses there, and he was the deputy sheriff. You remember that? <laughs> and the horses had come in. I had a white coat and a big scoop shovel. <laughs> and about seven, eight people working in my place and sometimes 10, 11 during those days. And the horses would get in, but I remember Peggy Donaldson this was. She came into place with a horse and pretty soon, there were a couple of them probably in the place at that time. I said, hey Peggy, get your horse out of here. Your horse is getting nervous. Didn't make it. <laughs> so, I, and I go and I get my white coat, put it on. I got the shovel, raked it up, and I had double front, double windows out, double doors out in front. And the people, you know, in Kelseyville or in Lafayette, when they the horse shows, they were like ants. Now, you, you've just got to see them. Believe it. I got a lot of pictures. I wish I'd have brought them. There you have some here. But anyway, I just open that door and go like that. And I almost get trampled to death. The people come in and see what happened. <laughs> that's, that's no truth. Of course, there were times we had slot machines. And then I used to board the one-inch boards. We used to buy them Corbett, put on the floors to keep the horses from going through the floors. And I, I'll tell you, this is the truth. There's a man that can witness everything I say over yeah, there. The and, and I think Mr. Ellis and some of the others. And... Uh, of course, there was that big explosion in 1944. Bob, I know most of you people know, blew about half of the windows in town out here in Kelsey, or Lafayette, from Port Chicago. I see. Well, and I told you about the employing uh, people, be, uh, employing people at a dollar a day, and boy, I'm telling you, that was something. The action didn't lose during my show. Mike can shovel for Peggy Donaldson. Board for and spirit, carrots, horses, horse and cart. Well, folks, that's the best I can do. If any people want to ask me questions, to the best of my knowledge, I'll answer them. Thank you, Lou. I appreciate that. I was hoping that you get down to the point where the horses were coming into the world. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. every, every horse got a carrot and every rider oh, got yeah. a beer. Mm -hmm. Didn't they get a free drink? Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell that just, yeah. just, just, just a minute, Lou. Yeah. Uh, every one of these horses that came in, the rider got a free beer and that horse got a carrot. They, if he didn't stay on his horse, he never got it. The horse got the carrot, but the guy didn't get the beer. <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, yeah, I would wrap like it up, Mick. One more thing. Uh, Lou and I were on the membership committee of the Horseman's Association when they had an option on 43 acres of land between Jonas Hill Road and Burton Station out in there. And they were going to build a clubhouse and stables and corrals and arena for a permanent place for the horse show. And it's a crying shame that that never went through because I'll bet Lafayette would have been known the world over because that was really a horse show we had here. But it just came up to about 43 and that was the war years, and the thing just fell through, and it's a dirty shame it did. Otherwise, we'd been on the map. <laughs> I'll tell you. Yeah, no. Lou, Mickey, your remarks have gotten to uh, Joan Merriman. Where'd she go? She wants to know 
if you could donate your notes to the society. Sure. Yeah, okay, sure. please, would you? Sure. We appreciate it. Uh, one thing before we close, or a couple things. Number one, if any of you have not renewed your membership, <laughs> why, uh, if you got the yellow bulletin put out by our bulletin editor, Mary McIver, we sure love to have your renewal. 